Hi, how are you? I hope you're doing well. I hope you enjoyed the last two chapters. I found some pictures of some animals that I thought I would share with you. One is a mink because I, I didn't really know or remember what a mink looked like. So I found a picture and there's some pictures of a mink. I thought they were pretty cute. Do you think they're cute? And then also a picture of a, a muskrat. So those are a couple pictures of some muskrats. I like the mink better. Which, which one do you think is cuter? I mean, they're both cute, but I just, my personal preference is the mink. All right, so we're going to read the next chapter called Little Joe Otter Takes Grandfather Frog's Advice. Who makes an enemy a friend to fear and worry puts an end. Little Joe Otter found that out when he took grandfather's advice. He wouldn't have admitted that he was afraid of Buster Bear. No one ever likes to admit to being afraid, least of all Little Joe Otter. And really, Little Joe has a great deal of courage. Very few of the little people of the green forest or the green meadows would willingly quarrel with him. <clears throat> For Little Joe is a great fighter when he has to fight. As for all those who live in or along the Laughing Brook or in the Smiling Pool, they let Little Joe have his own way in everything. Now, having one's own way too much is a bad thing. It is apt to make one selfish and thoughtless of other people and very hard to get along with. Little Joe Otter had his way too much. Grandfather Frog knew it and shook his head very soberly when Little Joe had been disrespectful to him. Too bad, too bad, too bad, chug a rum. It is too bad that such a fine young fellow as Little Joe should spoil a good disposition by such selfish, selfish heedlessness. Too bad, he thought. So, actually, said he. So, though he didn't let on that it was so, Grandfather Frog really was delighted when he heard how Buster Bear had been too smart for Little Joe Otter. It tickled him so that he had hard work to keep a straight face. But he did, and was as grave and solemn as you please, as he advised Little Joe always to make friends with anyone who was bigger and stronger and smarter than he. That was good common sense advice. But Little Joe just sniffed and went off declaring that he would get even with Buster Bear yet. Now Little Joe is good-natured and full of fun as a rule, and after he had reached home and his temper had cooled off a little, he began to see the joke on himself. How, when he had worked so hard to frighten the fish in the little pools of the Laughing Brook so that Buster Bear should not catch any, he had all the time been driving them right into Buster's paws. By and by, he grinned. It was a little she sheepish grin at first, but at last it grew into a laugh. Ha! I believe, said Little Joe, as he wiped tears of laughter from his eyes, that Grandfather Frog is right, and that the best thing I can do is to make friends with Buster Bear. I'll try it tomorrow morning. So very early the next morning, Little Joe Otter went to the best fishing pool he knew of in the Laughing Brook, and there he caught the biggest trout he could find. It was so big and fat that it made Little Joe's mouth water, for you know fat trout are his favorite food. But he didn't take so much as one bite. Instead, he carefully laid it on an old log, where Buster Bear would be sure to see it if he should come along that way. Then he hid nearby where he could watch. Buster was late that morning. It seemed to Little Joe that he never would come. Once he nearly lost the fish. He had turned his head for just a quick minute, and when he looked back again, the trout was nowhere to be seen. Buster couldn't have stolen up and taken it, because such a big fellow couldn't possibly have gotten out of sight again. 
Little Joe darted over to the log and looked on the other side. There was the fat trout, and there also was Little Joe's smallest cousin, Shadow the Weasel, who was a great thief and altogether bad. Little Joe sprang at him angrily, but Shadow was too quick and darted away. Little Joe put the fish back on the log and waited. This time he didn't take his eyes off it. At last, when he was almost ready to give up, he saw Buster Bear shuffling along towards the laughing brook. Suddenly, Buster stopped and sniffed. One of the merry little breezes had carried the scent of that felt fat trout over to him. Then he came straight over to where the fish lay, his nose wrinkling and his eyes twinkling with pleasure. Now I wonder who was so thoughtful as to leave this fine breakfast ready for me, said he out loud. Me, said Little Joe in a rather faint voice. I caught it specially for you. Thank you, replied Buster, and his eyes twinkled more than ever. I think we are going to be friends. I, I hope so, replied Little Joe. And that's the end of chapter six. Chapter seven is called Farmer Brown's Boy Has No Luck at All. Farmer Brown's boy tramped through the green forest whistling merrily. He always whistles when he feels lighthearted, and he always feels lighthearted when he goes fishing. Do you guys feel lighthearted when you go fishing? I know you love it. You see, he is just as fond of fishing as little Joe Otter or Billy Mink or Buster Bear. And now he was making his way through the green forest to the Laughing Brook sure that by the time he had followed it down to the smiling pool, he would have a fine lot of trout to take home. He knew every pool in the Laughing Brook where the trout loved to hide, did, did Farmer Brown's boy, and it was just the kind of morning when the trout should be hungry. So he whistled as he tramped along, and his whistle was good to hear. When he reached the first little pool, he baited his hook very carefully, and then, taking the greatest care to keep out of sight, taking the greatest care to keep out of sight of any trout that might be in the little pool, he began to fish. Now, Farmer Brown's boy learned a long time ago that to be a successful fisherman, one must have a great deal of patience. So though he didn't get a bite right away, as he had expected to, he wasn't the least bit discouraged. He kept very quiet and fished and fished and fished, patiently waiting for a foolish trout to take his hook. But he didn't get so much as a nibble. Either the trout have lost their appetite or they have grown very wise, muttered Farmer Brown's boy, as after a long time, he moved on to the next little pool. There the same thing happened. He was very patient, very, very patient, but his patience brought no reward, not so much as the faintest kind of nibble. Farmer Brown's boy trudged on to the next pool, and there was a puzzled frown on his freckled face. Such a thing had never happened before. He didn't know what to make of it. All the night before, he had dreamed about the delicious dinner of fried trout he would have the next day. And now, well, if he didn't catch some trout pretty soon, that splendid dinner would never be anything but a dream. If I didn't know that nobody else comes here fishing... I should think that somebody had been here this very morning and caught all the fish, or else frightened them so that they are all in hiding, said he as he trudged on to the next little pool. I never had such bad luck in all my life before. Hello, what's this? There on the bank beside the little pool were the heads of three trout. Farmer Brown's boy scowled down at them more puzzled than ever. Somebody has been fishing here, and they have had better luck than I have, thought he. 
He looked up the laughing brook and down the laughing brook, and this way and that way, but no one was to be seen. Then he picked up one of the little heads and looked at it sharply. It wasn't cut off with a knife. It was bitten off, he exclaimed. I wonder now if Billy Mink is the scramp who has spoiled my fun. Thereafter, he kept a sharp lookout for signs of Billy Mink. But though he found two or three more trout heads, he saw no other signs and he caught no fish. This puzzled him more than ever. It didn't seem possible that such a little fellow as Billy Meek could have caught or frightened all the fish or have eaten so many. Besides, he didn't remember ever having known Billy to leave heads around that way. Billy sometimes catches more fish than he can eat, but then he usually hides them. The farther he went down the laughing brook, the more puzzled Farmer Brown's boy grew. It made him feel very weird. He would have felt still more weird if he had known that all the time two other fishermen who had been before him were watching him and chuckling to themselves. Who do you think they are? They were Little Joe Otter and Buster Bear. All right, and that's the end of chapter seven. Next time we'll read, or we'll start with chapter eight called Farmer Brown's Boy Feels His Hair Rise. Oh, no, do you know why hair rises? That feeling of your hair going, it's because you're scared. Oh no, I wonder what's going to scare Farmer Brown, but Farmer Brown's boy. We'll have to wait till next time. Bye.